Week in Startups is brought to you by Mixmax, the number one Gmail-based productivity application that declutters your email, prioritizes tasks, and automates your day. Go to get.mixmax.com slash twist for $100 in credits. Digital Ocean, providing the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twist. And Smile Direct Club, exclusive offer for Twist listeners. Get $150 off your invisible aligners. Go to smiledirectclub.com slash podcast with promo code TWIST150. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I am your host, Jason Calacanis. We host this podcast 100 times a year, and we've done so for a decade and we're going to hit 1,000 episodes soon, 900 right around the corner. And we have a couple different types of guests on this podcast. Sometimes we'll have journalists. Sometimes we'll have investors. Other times we'll have founders. Today, we have a founder turned investor, and his name is James Joaquin, who I've known since the AOL days. Back in the day, you are one of the vets of Web 1.0, did a bunch in Web 2.0, and then on to being a venture capitalist. Welcome to This Week in Startups. Thank you for having me. It's 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 time. It's been a while. I was hoping I'd be your you know thousandth caller, but yeah, you know, no, I, I think close. the th- people are betting that the thousandth will be Elon. Okay. He's never been on the pod. Okay, everybody else has been on the pod, uh, but yeah, we haven't had Elon on yet. So maybe on the thousand. I think it should be Tim Cook because that would be great. you know Apple's always late to the category, but they do it well. So that I mean, makes a lot of sense. Could fit. Yeah. Uh, I always saw you as, and I, when, before we knew each other and became friendly, I always thought you were kind of like the hired gun CEO who, when you know the founders kind of needed some adult in the room or somebody polished, they'd bring you in. Is that true? That's not true. I mean, okay. I did that once. Ah, with Ophoto? With Zoom. With Zoom. So, That's right. I was recruited into a money transfer company called Zoom. I was not the founding CEO. That was a Sequoia company, wasn't Sequoia it? Sequoia and NEA. NEA, yeah. I had Pierre Lamond and Dick Kramlick on my board. These wow. are two of the founding fathers of venture capital. Pierre Lamond was one of the founders of Sequoia, I believe, or he joined Sequoia? He was, a, I think, a founder of National Semiconductor and an early partner ah, with right. Don Valentine at Sequoia. Right. These are the people who were working in the 70s and 80s in yes. Silicon Valley. Or yes. 70s, in fact. Yeah. Crazy. Make guys like us look young. Exactly. Uh, um, but you were also the president and CEO of Ophoto. Yeah, I was Kodak. there. Were I mean, you the founder of that as well? I or? was there from day zero. I was wow. a founding angel investor ah. and was kind of hanging around, keeping an eye on my investment. And, and the company needed a CEO. And it was kind of mutual love. And you wound up taking the reins. And I jumped in. Yeah. Ophoto got acquired by Kodak. It you guys did. were one of the first... Like Flickr, like service before Flickr. In fact. We were before Flickr. Yeah. We were one of the the you know OG online photo sharing services. Mm-hmm. There were three: it was O Photo, Shutterfly, and Snapfish. Right. Those were the three, and we were the early breakout in our day. We were bigger than Shutterfly, and and, and by bigger it was like you had ten million people, maybe. 20 million, because there weren't that many people on the web in 98, yeah. 99. Before we sold to Kodak, that's right. I mean, after we sold to Kodak, we grew the service to 70 million members wow. in, in my under my watch. It probably got bigger after that, but and this I stuck around for three phones. years. Yeah. The people nails... were taking digital photos, or were they taking film photos and then sending you the negatives to scan? We offered both, right. but we really started with digital. The, mm-hmm. the company, was Ophoto, was formed a, around this idea that consumers were going to rediscover photography with the advent of digital cameras that actually worked. And there were digital cameras at that time. For, for me, there was a, 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 a lightning rod moment. I bought a Nikon Coolpix 950. Cool this was a two megapixel camera and it cost $2,000. Wow. And that was an amazing deal. And you could fit how many photos on your f- camera and photo I mean, card? the memory cards were in the megabytes, not right. the gigabytes, right? right. But the, the key thing was two megapixels was enough image resolution that you could make a beautiful print. Ah. And so we started Ophoto to create online albums that you could then turn into beautiful Kodak prints. And here we are 20 years later... And you think about it, did you know at that time that, did you ever think when you guys were scanning in people's negatives or, you know, you had such a small number of people uploading photos, which what did it take to upload a photo back then? Like, 
a minute or two. It was three. painful. It was painful. It was painful. Did you ever think we would get to the point where we would have the type of, that the cameras on mobile phones would be better because of software and would be uploading in real time to the entire globe? Did you see that coming? We fortunately did yeah. because we would make regular trips to Japan. Ah. So we would scour the Akihabara district of Japan. Yes, I was just there. And we would see these amazing prototypes, and we watched what was happening with the NTT Docomo service. Right. And Explain what that is. That was really the first kind of mobile phone, cloud-connected service where in Japan, these phones had, they would run Java, they would have an app store, and developers were building these kind of mobile social geo apps. Right. And you way before these were buzzwords in the United States. Yeah, they were flip phones. And they were flip phones. With a With huge color displays. Color displays, but it was, a, it was like a weird format. It was like a rectangle, like a tall, skinny rectangle. Yes. And I remember when I saw it, they were all playing a fishing game where they were on the subway in Japan flipping their phones open and they would be fishing on their phones. Like, you know, like th that was the big popular app when I happened to be there. But you saw it clearly? You knew this was going to happen, huh? We did, yeah. yeah. And we actually built, we had already sold to Kodak, but we built a version of Ophoto called Kodak Mobile uh. so that we could partner with the cell phone companies because even though the nails on the film coffin were still warm, we yeah. saw mobile photography showing up ready to wipe out the digital still camera, the yeah. low end of the camera market. And so we, we tried to get ahead of that. What we didn't see was the, the rise of the smartphone, of course. Right. It is amazing. Like This Pixel 3, people are talking about the taking pictures at night that are as crisp as daylight pictures. Yeah. And it's all done through software, mm -hmm. which is super weird when you think about it. The software on the phones is making a reality that then winds up on Instagram, which was that reality is, of course, layered with filters. So you have this two-step process where reality is being distorted, and then we all consume each other's reality that have gone through two layers of filtering, one that people don't even know. Jason, that's not dissimilar to how your retina and your optic nerve and your brain work. Explain. I mean, what you're seeing is, you know, a, a bunch of processing that your brain has done of right. all of these light field photons that are hitting your eyes. That's true. Very, I, a very small amount of that information actually makes it to your brain. And then your brain just fills in the rest. Right. So in a way, what the Pixel 3 might be doing is taking a better rendering of actually what's happening mm -hmm. in the world. Well said. It's fascinating. It's interesting. I was talking to somebody and they were telling me that their corporate clients are asking for though, you know, like in the drone technology, because there's so much stabilization going, so much refining of reality or of the pixels that they're saying uh the corporate clients are saying please remove all that we want the raw interesting or just give us the raw and the other one so because we need to see ground truth we don't want you taking out it's the, like going back to vinyl it is like going back to vinyl in a way um and then i guess you got into venture capital somewhere right before the financial crisis Basically, yeah. Great timing, yeah. actually. And when I say great timing, people are laughing like I'm making it's a joke. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. It actually is the best time to get in. When 100%. the market is on the floor. Yeah. So and we have a mutual friend, Matthew Cowan, who yes. really gave me my start in venture capital. I didn't know that's how yeah. that went down. Explain. Mm -hmm. Well, he had co-founded a growth stage firm called Bridge Scale Partners. Right. And he and his co-founder, Rob Chaplinsky, recruited me in as a venture partner. Ah, explain what a and venture partner is. for your listeners, is, yeah. a venture partner is a term of art, not science, in the venture capital world. And it's a way to try someone on for size as an investor mm. that maybe has shown success in a different domain, successful entrepreneur or successful journalist or who knows what. Right. But you really want to find out whether that person's good at venture, whether they like venture and whether venture likes them. And so Venture Partner is a great kind of entry point to start. And they give you a piece of the carry on just your deals, I guess? Different firms do it different ways. What do you think is the common way it's done? A little bit of cash, a little bit of I think there's two carry. kinds of Venture Partners, to be honest. Okay, I yeah. think there's a part-time Venture Partner. And oh. um, those, you know, those folks usually have very small economics, mm -hmm. um, but they want a brand association with the firm 
and the firm wants a brand association with them. And so that's sort of like a scout almost. Almost like a scout. Yeah. Um, and that's different than where I started, which I yeah. was a full-time investor. I Got was it. taking board seats. I had economics in the full fund across the portfolio. Oh, that's so great. So it was really a try before you buy Got on it. ramp to being a full partner. And at that time, correct me if I'm wrong, venture was still the domain of MBAs, or it was just starting to turn out that maybe people could consider founders for this. You were mm -hmm. kind of that first wave of yeah. like, maybe a founder could do this job because founder friendly venture capital was just starting at that time. I guess post yeah. Zuckerberg, yep. post Sean Parker yep. drama with Plaxo, et cetera, the, the world started to change a bit. I think a, a few years after I first crossed over to the venture side of the table, I saw that world changing. Yeah. But when I first showed up, it was very much people with finance, investment banking, yeah, Harvard MBA, Stanford MBA, usual suspects. No operating experience telling operators in the thick of it how to run their businesses. Which I had experienced firsthand as an operator, Right, that gap. And so- It I, was real. It was real. And I think I was part of a whole generation of operators that said, hey, we think we can do this in a different way. We can actually roll up our sleeves and help. We can be more- aligned with the founders because we understand what they're going through. We can be ha certainly have more empathy for the mm. founders. Right. A lot of the stress, a lot of the mental health issues, a lot of the yeah. just brutal process brutal. that we go through to defy gravity to put a startup on the map. All right. When we get back from this quick break, I want to talk about the founding of Obvious Ventures, uh, which I believe you did with our friend uh, Evan Williams, and the closing of the first fund which was $123,456,789. You guessed it, folks, when we get back on This Week in Startups. My sales team is obsessed with MixMax, M-I-X-M-A-X. It's a Gmail-based productivity application, and it provides massively powerful campaign analytics, and it supercharges your efficiency in really three areas, sales, outbound sales engagement, automation, and analytics for bringing in new business. Wouldn't 70% open rates and 50 to 60% reply rates be great for your startup, for your sales team? We'll go ask them. And many customer success teams do not have a one-to-one -one relationship with customers. That's what you want. Recruitment as well, scheduling, availability, it keeps you super busy. Well, imagine you get an email that says, pick one of these dates, boom, or vote on which one of these dates you want. Thumbtack sales teams uses it, and so does their HR team, and they love it. Our sales team loves it, and... Grant from my team said their sales efficiency and effectiveness has taken off since switching to Mix Max. They love it. Through simple email sequencing and automation, they've achieved absurdly good results. I mean, ridiculous. 91% open rates, 20% click rates, 30% reply rates, 10% outbound emails to meeting conversion. That's the key. You want to get those emails to conversions going. And one out of every 10 cold emails converts into a meeting now. And we're tracking all this. This is the pipeline management. And this is the sequencing that high-end sales teams are doing. Well, it's available for everybody with MixMax. So I want you to go to get.mixmax.com slash twist. Get dot mixmax.com slash twist T W I S T and you're gonna get a hundred dollars a C note a hundy in credits with a minimum of three annual licenses. There's no strings attached, no credit card required to get a demo. Uh, and it's great for your sales team, it's great for executives, recruitment, customer success, all of that. So start tracking. Get dot mixmax.com slash twist. You're gonna love this product. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. My guest today, James Joaquin, which is like Joaquin Phoenix. Correct. River Phoenix's brother. God I thought rest. about naming my son Phoenix, but ah. that would just be a cruel pun. It would be. be. Phoenix Joaquin. Yeah. I miss River Phoenix. That was so sad. I, were you born in 70, 68, 72? Late you? 60s. Late 60s, Yeah, right? I'm, I'm a little 70. bit older than you, A little older man. than me, yeah. And do you, you remember River Phoenix, mm -hmm, of course. I do. Yeah, it's just so sad when he died. But his And his brother is so good. Mm -hmm. I love Joaquin Phoenix. I just saw... Maybe you love all Joaquins. I, it is, well, it's I do possible. have an affinity for you as well, James. <laughs> um, 
but it is interesting. Like his brother did the film, uh, the master. Have you ever seen the master? I've never seen it. It's on my oh wish list. My Lord. When it comes out in 35 millimeter, they have a 70 millimeter print. I'm sorry. Um, when that comes back around, you and mm. I will go see this film is one of my okay. f- most favorite, fi- my, one of my top 10 films of all time because of the performances of Joaquin Phoenix and Philip Seymour Hoffman, who plays kind of like, L. Ron Hubbard-ish. Mm-hmm, right. It has nothing to do with Scientology. It just has to do with two men yes. trying to be important in the world and trying to make sense of the world and the power dynamics in religion yeah. and man's search for meaning. It, it's it's not about Scientology. It's like everybody, that's why I think the film... And, and this is the movie you're going to take me on for a date night. Absolutely. Okay. Because it is one of the most beautiful movies. Rachel Adams, incredible. I mean... The performances are ridiculous, but it was also shot incredibly. Okay, I'm in. Okay, Amy Adams. Sorry, did I say Rachel Adams? Amy Adams, thank you. Um, and Hoffman died of an overdose, too. Mm. Oh, God, heroin is... If I have uh. one message for every young person, never, ever, in your life, ever take opioids. It is such a quick path to death and destruction of careers. I mean, ugh. Scary stuff. It's super scary. Yeah. And just all these talented people, it's just, they're all trying to get rid of their pain. It's terrible. Maybe but you, we you need bring... a new kind of venture capital to build solutions <laughs> to these challenges like well, this. Well, it's interesting because um, before we went for the break, we were talking about mental health. It is a major issue in our industry because- It absolutely is. I believe that people who are drawn to extreme pursuits might also be drawn to them for certain reasons. Do mm-hmm. you agree with that? I do. What is it about being a founder that leads to suicide, depression, anxiety, all these things? It may be an obvious question, but... I think it's probably a long answer, yeah, but let's the, do it. the obvious part, you and I both know, you have to be risk-prone right. and fearless. And so you're doing something that is inherently likely to fail, yet you have to convince others that you are infallible and will succeed. So the distance between the reality and what you're putting out there is great. Yes. And that's never good for grounding. And when you add to that startup environments where people are living and working together in a 90 hours a week and loving yeah. it pressure cooker, yeah. you lose maybe some of the support system of a separate family, friend support ah. that's outside of that startup reality distortion field that you're creating. And then you have a gap between... The, the ground truth of your startup, which is, listen, they're all likely going to fail. The majority fail. You're putting out there, we're going to change the world. So there's a big gap. That's right. Which you know, but you're forced to deny that reality. Mm-hmm. Almost like somebody going into war or something. You have to just like put your fear on pause. And uh, then you have to ignore friendships, relationships, everything else that might have kept you grounded. Yeah. So that is a quick way to yeah, get knocked off of center. I always tell founders, you are not the startup. The startup is something you created. And this is your first idea or your second idea. It's likely to not be your best idea. Your best idea is probably in front of you. So look at this. Just mm. always remember that, James, you created Ophoto. Ophoto did not create James, right? It doesn't define me. It doesn't define you. That's it right. is not who you are. It, it's it's what you've built, and it's one in a series of things that you will build. How Jay, do you handle it? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, yeah, Jason. Yeah. You you do a lot of crazy early angel investing. Yeah, with the young founders you're yeah. working with early, do you ever see them getting a, a CEO coach, any kind of a founder coach? I kind of feel I play that role when things are bad, mm-hmm. but not when things are good. In other words, like. Mm-hmm. They know they can call me because I give them that little speech. Hey, when mm-hmm. things are truly effed up mm-hmm. and you can't tell your team how effed up it is because they'll quit. Mm-hmm. You can't tell your board or your investors how exactly. effed up it is because you'll fire you and not mm-hmm. fund you. Mm-hmm. Who do you call? And right. I, ju- I just tell them, call me because I'm investing knowing that every company I invest in is on the verge of going off the rails. So that's a huge benefit they have. If yeah, they can, but not coaching specifically. But, you know, But not all companies have that. And for us, we strongly recommend to our CEOs... And we do a lot of matchmaking to get them a coach. Oh, really? And, you know, I think it's 50% performance, right? Mm. Enlightened self-interest on better 
business performance and 50% mental health. Right. There's a component of coaching that's, you know, like cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT. Yeah. If people don't even know what that term is, it's, how would you define CBT for people, cognitive behavioral therapy? I mean, I'm not a expert I know you're in not the therapist, field, but, but we, I mean, we've all, we all, I think, know something about therapy yeah. or people that have a therapist yeah. or have been to, yeah. whether it's couples therapy or family yeah. therapy. Yeah. That's, you know, there's decades of research and efficacy around that yeah. mo- that modality of treatment called CBT. Yeah, I would tell people the the way I like to describe people is how you uh, think about your thinking, mm. right? Like it's a sort of a metacognition, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. level two thinking. So when you think about the future, mm-hmm. does it put you into a sense of panic and anxiety? Mm-hmm. When you think about the past, are you filled with rage or regret? Right. And are you aware of it? Because being self-aware is something you, I think you get to later in life, hopefully, but Mm -hmm. a lot of young people don't have any of that self-awareness, so they don't know, oh, I'm acting out of fear because of what happened in my past, or I'm acting out of, uh, you know, I've got this anxiety I'm feeling is because of the future. Right. You know, like, oh, will I raise my next round? There's nine months in the bank. Or this insecurity or this aggression or whatever that is. Where does that all come from? If you can observe that and then detach your sense of self from that emotion that you're experiencing. Right you'd probably be a lot healthier in how you process it. Yeah, exactly. Which is what meditation... I think that's why meditation is sweeping across our industry. I completely agree. Stoicism probably as well. Like everybody's getting a little stoic out there. Which and is you know, all... my co-founder, Ev Williams, yes. is the first person to really turn me on to meditation. Yeah. No, Ev's big and into it. And it's something we do. We bring, you know, guided meditation into the office. Yeah. Uh, we're big proponents here. We were like uh, big investors in com.com mm-hmm. when they started. And that's right. We. How did you and Ev hook up and decide you were going to do Obvious Ventures and why the name Obvious? Obvious question. Evan I met in 2004. He was doing what, Blogger? He had just sold Blogger to Google. Yum, yum, yum. And we met at the TED conference in Monterey, California. I remember You this. may remember I'm a longtime Tedster. Tedster, My yeah. better half, Zem. Yes. And we're friends with Megan Smith. She's an old colleague of mine yep. from Planet Out. Apple days. And, and we were at Apple together before she did uh, Planet Out. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, Megan, for your listeners, went on to be the chief technology officer of the United States. Under, under Obama. Under Obama. Yeah. And Megan at the time was an executive at Google. And so she was kind of showing Ev around and introducing him to folks. And that's where we first met. Ah. And we became fast friends. And that led to what I would describe as a multi-year conversation with Ev about what's the role of venture capital? What's the role of capitalism? Mm. How do we use entrepreneurship and the money that fuels it to solve big problems, to Mm. reimagine big industries? And... That's a lot of what I was trying to do in my arc, mm. my career in venture capital. And, you know, that conversation led to Ev saying like, hey, are you serious about, you know, creating a purpose-built fund to do that? Yeah. You know, if so, so am I. Wow. And, you know, we joined forces with our third co-founder, Vishal Vasish, mm. who spent 11 years with Avon Chouinard building Patagonia. Ah, you probably own one or more pieces of Patagonia clothing. Patagonia clothing yeah. It's one of my favorite examples of a purpose-driven North Star company. That's that, what do you mean by that? Define I mean, it's, it for a, me. it's a company that is genuinely, authentically mission-driven. They make their business decisions based on their mission of treading lightly on the planet. Got it. And when they make those decisions, historically for Patagonia, it has generated more profits for them. Got it. So they have created a flywheel where that purpose drives their profit. Got it. And it's important for founders to have some sort of a clearly stated mission. Why? How much time do you have? I mean, for yeah. a thousand reasons. Yeah, give me the top one. Or top well, two. Yeah. I, how long do you think you're on this planet for, Jason? I 70, mean, 80 years. I think if you're lucky. I think longer because I think uh, we we tend to oh, not right. we not think we don't think exponentially. But yeah, let 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 let's say you're oh, here. Oh, you for, actually buy into the like we might live to 120. Well, let's say you live for 80 to 100 years. We'll Great. just pick that as a range. I would love that. That's a pretty short period of time in the history of the universe. What do you want to do while you're here? Right. What's your purpose? What kind of dent do you want to make? What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? To me, creating a purpose-driven business is part of having a purpose-driven life. And I think we're seeing a generational shift, young entrepreneurs, more than I've ever seen, they are all about this. Yeah. Yes, they wanna make money, but they also want meaning in their work. Right. And so that's what I mean by that. Yeah, it is interesting, the generational shift between millennials even, Mm -hmm. and, because we're Gen X, 
Then there's millennials. After well, this. you know what we are? What? We're perennials. What does it mean? Perennials? This is a term coined yeah. by the brilliant Gina Pell. Oh, okay. And it's in response to defining people by their birth year. Putting ah. you in, a, in, a, in an age box right. doesn't give you enough credit for the fact that you're a polymath. You're always learning. Oh, you're you staying evolve, creative. Right. You're learning new things. Sure. You're, and so that's a perennial, someone yeah. who stays young and stays oh, creative and stays that. fresh. I love that. I yeah, see. I agree. I, I will say that I am not, as a perennial, I skip the millennial because that was just too much narcissism and not enough <laughs> actual skills. But when we get back, I want to go through uh, the portfolio and a lot of these incredible uh, investments you've made. And we have and, to talk about the, the, the fund number for the first fund. Yes. And yeah. why you raised $123,456,789. For the first time when we get back on This Week in Startups. Happy New Year, everybody. It's 2019, and you know what you need for your startup. You need to scale your infrastructure to match all your explosive growth. Well, if you want the best cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications, that is DigitalOcean. 150,000 businesses are using DigitalOcean, over 150,000, and they are one of Inc.'s world's fastest growing startups. You get free round the clock tech support for all of the customers that use the service, regardless of the spend. And there's a huge learning community with resources and tutorials ready to go. It's business ready and it's here, ready to scale with you. Very straightforward billing. You're always gonna know what you'll pay. Get a hundy, a hundred dollars right now by going to do.co slash twist. Yes, go to do.co slash twist. They got the nice short domain name. And here is an amazing customer testimonial. Listen to this, everybody. Since moving to DigitalOcean, our setup is ultimately more capable than what we had before the migration. Downtime has become a rarity and our hosting costs have decreased by more than 90%. What? You're gonna save a ton of money. You're gonna get better service and you're going to love how easy and simple it is to use. DigitalOcean, an amazing company. Uh, we've had Mitch Weiner on the program a couple of times. Great guy, great company, great founders. They raised a ton of money, and they are building the world's greatest cloud platform. So go ahead and get that hundy right now by going to do.co slash twist. Go ahead and get that $100. That offer may not last, so I need you to do it right now, today. do.co slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and my guest today, James Joaquin. You can follow on the Twitter, James, J-O-A-Q-U-I-N. Joaquin. What is what is the origin of Joaquin, I wonder? I don't actually know. Well, it's a Spanish name, uh -huh. but it's not my actual family heritage name. Got it. Uh, that is Joaquin, ending in an M. Joaquin. So it probably got changed at Ellis Island, but yeah. my ethnic heritage is a mix of Portuguese and Cape Verdean. Cape Verdean. What? Now called Cabo Verde. It's its own island. It's its own nation, excuse me, but it was a huh. Portuguese colony off the coast of Senegal. Huh. Wow. Off the coast of West Africa. Wow. Did you take a uh, 23 and Me, or are you afraid to take that and find oh. out your heritage is not, not only, what you thought it was? Not only did I take 23 and Me, I'm friends with Anne and Linda, the co-founders, so I went to their launch spit party. <laughs> and it just so happened I got filmed by the CBS Evening News as one Spitting of the first into a people to a, spit into a tube. Into a tube. Yeah. And it, it's going to be my gravestone, did it, did it, did early what, spitter. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Did, did it align? Did what you thought your heritage was align perfectly or were there things that you didn't know? It's a great question. I mean, yeah. I thought on my mother's side of the family, which is the whaling side of the yeah. family, that they were from the Azores. Huh. But through 23andMe is how I discovered that it was actually... Wow. Cabo Verde, not the Azores. Yeah, there's a lot of people right now discovering things about their heritage. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. Mm -hmm. I bet. And I have a couple of friends. And one of my friends... Are you going to name names? No, I cannot, because this has nothing to do with origin. This has to do with siblings. And I have a friend mm -hmm. who was alerted through 23andMe that they had a sibling they didn't know about. And I guess the way 23andMe does it is you can opt in to know... It's a double blind. And it's a double opt-in. Mm -hmm. And if both people opt in, it shares. Reveals. My friend at you know, our age That's discovered cool. they have a sister. Isn't that cool? That's world positive. In a way, it, I, I guess it's world positive. I think it it's could world also positive. be it could shake you if you don't have a foundation because 
you might have found out that your parent had a liaison right. at some point and didn't tell anybody, and that the other person right. didn't know who they thought their father for 50 that's years right. was, was their, their father, and it father. wasn't. Yeah. So that's what's coming out. Is... Well, if it shakes you, that's when you call your CEO coach. Absolutely. What does a CEO coach cost? And who are these people and what makes them qualified? What do they Broad cost? Shrugs. I mean, they build, an, they build at an hourly rate. Like 500 bucks? You know, different ones at different bucks. rates. What do you think? I don't Range. think it's 1,000. I think it's less. Like 500 bucks? 200. Oh, that's it? I got to get some referrals on it. If anybody's a and CEO coach, I need to know about this. Jason, I can't obvious, kind of we've, we've built a whole set of referrals oh, cool. for our founders. I can send you that. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah, I think it's to. a good idea because if you're spending, what do they do, like four hours a month or something? You know, again, weekly? different things, different strokes for different folks, but like a weekly check-in. Weekly check-in. Do an hour a week as a check-in. That's pretty good. Yeah. What do so coaches do when- money well spent. What do coaches do when something comes up that feels like it's about more personal than business? Because all business is personal. We and I, you and I know that, but- do they refer, I guess? I think they do. Yeah. And some some of these coaches are licensed therapists. Ah, some are not. Got it. I don't think any of them are uh, psychiatrists. Right. They're so not they're giving They're certainly scrims. not going to go into the medical realm. Right. Um, but they certainly, if it's, a, if it's something where they think, hey, you know, this is a family therapy mm -hmm. issue, I'm going to make a referral to someone I know and trust. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Why? For so your you first know, fund. Do you know what the Form D database is that the SEC runs? Yes. The Form D database is when people are doing a, a raise of some Any kind. Any kind of, yeah. Financing, raising. You have raising to... of capital. You have to disclose it to the federal government. Right. And when we were first starting Obvious Ventures, one of the things that we learned is that the tech press, your former yes. uh, industry, they love to watch this database like a hawk. Yes. And yeah. so that the moment they see that XYZ fund raised a billion dollar fund, they can write the TechCrunch article. Right, they beat each other out. And it's a race. They're camped. And so number one, we observe that. That's the easy part. I think the hard part or the, the more meaningful insight is that we observe that the numbers were all boring. Mm. 250, 500, right. 1.2. And we thought, you know, if you have the best finance and tech press in the world all watching at your doorstep for what you're gonna file, why don't you actually do something interesting? Mm. So with our first fund, we were trying to raise $100 million as our inaugural fund. We were very fortunate to get what's called oversubscribed in the yeah. business. We had a little more money. So when we got into the kind of 120 million zone, I showed up at Ev's office and I said, hey, will you sign this amendment that you know increases your capital commitment to the fund by this weird number? <laughs> and he looked at it, he signed it, and then he looked up at me and he said, why am I signing this? <laughs> and That's a very it's a sign moment. of trust. Sign That's of trust. a very F moment. And I smiled and I said, well, you're going to find out tomorrow morning because, you know, 4 p.m. I'm And I explained, we're going to submit the Form D for the final close of our fund. And then I went to the whiteboard and I said, this is going to be the number. And in mathematics terms, it's one nine sequential. One, right. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. And the next day, not only did we get a ton of printed press, yeah. I got invited on to CNBC nice. Squawk Alley to talk about this one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine fund. So <laughs> that's the origin story of that number. Uh, tell me about some of the uh, companies and are you tied to doing good in the world? Because I I think people perceived Obvious as like an Omidyar kind of a fund where it was... I don't know, triple bottom line or purpose, you, and you use purpose a lot in this conversation, are you focused on returns or are you focused on 100%. making the world a better place? 100% focused on returns. Okay, so you're not an Look, impact fund? We are not. In fact, we ban the I word in Got the it. office. So okay. let, let me, if I may, yeah, just I'll tell you quickly, you know, yeah. the, the origins of Obvious in Silicon Valley are is the work that Ev and Biz did. When they left Google, they mm. started Obvious Group and right. they launched something called Odeo. Podcasting, Podcasting yeah. didn't work, yeah. thanks to Apple building it into iTunes. Yep. And so then they started working on some new things, and one of those new things was Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. So chapter one of Obvious turned into Twitter. Right. Pretty good outcome. Yeah, you think? 
when Evan Biz left operating roles and, and also Jason Goldman, when they left operating roles at Twitter, they got the band back together and they started Obvious Corporation. Mm-hmm. So this was chapter two and they were doing a mix of incubating and angel investing yeah. in around this idea of world positive yeah. startups. They incubated Jelly, which Biz went and yeah, ran Q&A a CEO service. and it got acquired by Pinterest. They incubated something called Medium. Yep, I'm an investor. Uh, that yep. Ev decided he was going to, you know, run full time. That that was, you know, yeah, a publishing really, really big platform, idea. which is now a publisher itself. It's with a, a subscription it's model. It's a publisher as well as a network. Yeah, with a with a freemium model. Yeah, and and Jason Goldman went into the digital services team for Obama, so he went right. into public service. But at that moment, that's when Obvious Ventures really started because ah. Ev said, "Hey, I'm going to be running Medium full time." Ah. You know, he said to Vishal and I, if you guys are serious about doing this, you guys go build the fund. I'm going to go build Medium. Is it 100% him as an LP or was he the... No, no, no. But he, he was our anchor LP. Got it. Um, and we, he, we've titrated his percentage down over time. We're Got investing it. out of our second fund now. Great. So we have a mix of institutional LPs alongside of... We have some other tech titans and, yeah. you know... Families, notables. Notable families in there as well, which again, right. we're very fortunate so to So not have. impact, but world positive. Yeah. And and that's, you know, sounds like a marketing term, but the reason we came up with world positive, and I have to give Biz credit yeah. for first uh, archetyping that, that term, we wanted something to describe these new kinds of entrepreneurs, purpose-driven, and new kinds of startups that were reimagining huge categories. Yeah. So think about the consumer food category, multi-trillion dollar business. Sure. You had one of our CEOs on your show, Bentley Hall, yeah. reimagining grocery delivery for food with good eggs. Love good eggs. Oh. Think about animal protein and how big that business is. Mm. We placed a bet to reimagine it by making it with plants, with our investments in Beyond Meat, creators of the Beyond Burger, Miyoko's Kitchen, which makes delicious cultured butter and yeah. aged cheeses, all from plants. Wow. 100% vegan. Yeah. Beyond Meat is surprising to me. I had the Beyond Meat Burger, mm. the 1.0. I know the 2.0 is out. Okay. But I had the 1.0 at uh, Umami Burger here in the city of San Francisco. You might be confusing Beyond with Impossible. Is oh, that, I'm the Impossible. Is that, oh, is that wait. Possible? Be- that yeah. is possible. Wait a second. Beyond makes the chicken. Started with chicken. That's chicken. right. I've had that's that too, right. and that's pretty amazing. But the uh, bre- the breakout product is the Beyond Burger and now Beyond uh, Sausage also, uh, which you can buy at Whole Foods, at Safeway. It. It's available uh, at grocery stores. What's the difference between Impossible and Beyond, would you say, of the burgers? Or are they both pursuing the same strategy? Are they like Yahoo, Google? They're like, I think of them as Uber a band Lyft. of brothers. They're both yeah. trying to turn the ship and give people delicious, nutritious options that are alternatives to eating animals. Got it. Impossible started in restaurants. Got it. Beyond Burger is a more kind of accessible, affordable product you I can get. I had Beyond Burger, but I had the chicken after Mark Bittman at the New York Times. Mm. I don't. You must know. He, this I article. remember that taste test. Yes, I do. Mark Bittman did like a chicken in pasta. Mm-hmm. You know, a little bit of sauce on yeah. it. Yeah, and like an Alfredo sauce. Or an something. Alfredo sauce or something, yeah. and he couldn't. They did a blind taste with him. He couldn't tell the difference. And this guy is like a and that's world the guy. expert foodie. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, a pretty magical moment. Yeah. Now, I think if you eat it without sauce, you probably could tell, or not. What do you think? With the chicken, you could tell. Yeah. Um. With the with the burger, not so much. Yeah. I mean, you know, my kids prefer it. Really? Yeah. That's what I was going to say yeah. about the Impossible Burger. They go in the fridge and just that cook a I actually burger. went back to Umami and I got the Impossible Burger again. Mm-hmm. And I was like, right wait, on. what am I doing? Because I'm a meat eater. I like steak. I like yeah. brisket. You only have to be on my and Instagram not, to see you're that. Not doing, you're not making that choice to save the planet. No, it was flavor. But little did you know, there's a, like a 99% decrease in greenhouse gases and water use. I actually did knew that. I knew if that. you go to these plant burgers. So. I didn't know it was 99, but I knew it was a lot because cows farting and the amount of waste produced and the water and the clear cutting of the rainforest to grow the soybeans to feed to the cows it's uh, when you when you when you so, add that up it's bad you think we're going to get But to the, the point, point is we're not trying to convince you of that we're trying to win you know taste. with your taste buds in your stomach and eventually cost yeah that i too. think the big win is not only when it's cost less um, and tastes better or it tastes as good but i think there's going to be a new category of food created that is doesn't exist in our current conception of food, but that will be better. So I had one of the fish companies on, mm. and they gave me a little taste on air of it. Yeah. I forgot which company is. Emmy Award-winning producer Jack will tell me in the in the chat room in a minute. 
But Finless, thank you, Finless Foods. Are you an investor in Finless? I'm not an investor. Have you I'm met with them? You met the them, yeah. Great product. So, great product. And I said to him, you know, when will I have a piece of Toro? Hmm. Toro, Cho Toro, O Toro are the grades. That's better than O Toro. In other words, I, I know you're going to catch up to them. It's Muzu, obvious. Muzukashi this. <laughs> when are we going to get past it? Yes. When will it be even better than O Toro? He goes, you know, nobody's ever asked me that question. It's a good question. He thought for a second. He goes, I think 10 years from now, I think we'll catch up to Toro in four or five years, mm -hmm. but we'll have something better than Toro. Right. That's when it gets a game changer. Isn't that cool? That's pretty crazy to think when about. When science fiction becomes reality. Yeah. See, people I think are... And, and that's a great example of what we mean by world positive, yeah. right? And it's it, it's different. It, it it really is almost back to the roots of venture capital, funding a lot of frontier innovation. And I'd love to give you one more example. Yeah, please. Listen. What do you think about when I say the words diamond mining? Well, blood diamonds, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. people losing their arms. Environmental and... damage. Sure. Child slavery, murder. Yeah. You know. Not so good. Yeah. Bad. Why don't we reimagine that huge industry and, and just grow the diamonds in plasma reactors? Right. So we made an investment in a company called Diamond Foundry that's doing that. Yeah. And it's incredible. They're, they're up to, you know, six carat polished diamond stones, eight carat rough diamonds. I heard there's some sharp elbows in the diamond industry over this. Like uh, the De Beers of the world, I think they bought, uh, I don't want to say fake diamonds, but uh, lab diamonds. Do they buy a lab diamond company? My understanding is De Beers does own a, 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 lab. a lab diamond yeah, and company. Yeah, and they're lowering the prices dramatically. And, and they've announced that they're going to enter yeah. the jewelry space with right. it. Which yeah. to me is great news. That's it's actually like great news. They've said uncle. They spent millions of dollars right. fighting these lab-grown diamonds, these yeah. above-ground diamonds. And right. now they're saying, you know what? The millennial woman doesn't want a blood diamond on her finger. Yeah. I heard we better that, meet the customer where they are. Here's the sinister thing I heard, because I was in a meeting with some diamond people. I won't make you uh, reply on it, but uh, that they wanted to, they bought this company, started doing it because they want to undercut the other folks by making them so cheap that the distance between the real ones and the fake ones is so great that you devalue them, which I was like, I don't think that's going to work because millennials will not even buy a car. They will not commit to a car. So if you tell them, that there's a cheaper option. You can take Uber Pool or Lyft Line. They're all in. They're not trying to gain status by buying objects. Yeah, That's yeah, the, they'll, yeah. but they'll gain status by going to Coachella both weekends. And they will be smart and understand the authenticity of the company and the brand they're buying from. Right. So, you know, only time will tell, but we know that competition is a good thing for markets. It's a great yeah. thing for consumers. Look what Elon did in so, electric cars. I mean, nobody was making anything. And exactly. All they did was deride him over like range and cost, range anxiety and cost. And I drove to Tahoe with the new Model 3 or Truckee and it goes 320 miles. You can get there without stopping. Another great world positive example. Right. Tesla's a world positive company for sure. When we come back, I wanted to get your thoughts on, New York Times had a story today on people being uh, founders, being down on venture capitalists because of the unrealistic expectations. And if you agree that the venture industrial complex, if you mm. will, is pushing people too hard and it's causing bad behavior and unsustainability and other bad effects mm. in the industry when we get back on the Swing Startups. Are you a smile hider? Do you get embarrassed when you smile because your teeth don't look as good as you want them to? Well, let's get something straight here. Your teeth. The ones that you cover when you laugh or you hide when someone breaks out a camera. Well, with Smile Direct Club, and you've heard of them before, I have friends who've used it, you can straighten your teeth with invisible aligners that are sent to you directly in the mail. That's right. You don't have to go to a doctor. They send you these aligners directly in the mail. And the invisible aligners work gently and discreetly to gradually guide your teeth into alignment. One of their over 200 duty licensed doctors oversee your plan every step of the way for only $80 a month. Can you believe that $80 a month? You can have a smile you'll love and a lifetime of confidence. No braces, no monthly office business, and you're not going to pay a fortune. Go to smiledirectclub.com to see real before and after photos. More than 350,000 satisfied grins are out there. And here's your call to action. You're not going to believe it, but you're going to get $150 off. So you're going to order a free impression kit with a rebate, or you're going to schedule a free 3D scan at one of their smile shops. And Smile Direct has this incredible offer. 
You go to smiledirectclub.com slash podcast. You're listening to a podcast. Smiledirectclub.com slash podcast and use the promo code TWIST150. TWIST150 and you get $150. And if it's 80 bucks a month, that's almost the first two months are basically free. So go ahead and get that call to action going right now. Smiledirectclub.com slash podcast and use the promo code TWIST150. Welcome to the club of This Week in Startup Supporters, Smile Direct Club. We're glad to have you. SmileDirectClub.com slash podcast, promo code TWIST150 for 150 bucks. Very generous. Thank you. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can follow me at Jason on Instagram and Twitter and the show at TWI Startups. Thanks to our partners for making all things possible and keeping the show free for founders for a decade. That uh, means a lot. We're going to be a 10 years old uh, this spring. My guest today, uh, the co-founder of Obvious Ventures, James Joaquin, and you can follow him, James, J-O-A-Q-U-I-N, on the Twitter, uh, which is what his co-founder, Ev Williams, created as well. I've heard of that. You've heard of Ev. Great guy. Um, but he doesn't use Twitter all that much, which is kind of paradoxical. Ev uses an economy of words. Yes. You know, so. and, and letters for his and name, letters. at E-V. Um, anyway, in the New York times today, um, uh, or recently, they just happened to have this story, uh, which I know you haven't read yet, but, uh, more startups have an unfamiliar message for venture capitalists, get lost. And, um, it basically just talks here that, um, uh, we're pretty much on different, totally different wavelengths. They try to make you feel inferior and you're not play if you're not playing the game, um, and they're helping people accelerate straight to the ground. Um, and the VC business model on which much of the modern tech industry is built is simple. Startups raise piles of money from investors and then use the cash to grow aggressively. No news flash there. Faster than the competition, faster than regulators, faster than normal businesses would consider sane. Larger and larger rounds of funding follow. The end goal is to sell a republic, producing astonishing returns to early stage investors. Sounds good to me. The setup has spawned household names like Facebook, Google, and Uber, as well as hundreds of other so-called unicorn companies for a billion. But for every unicorn, there are countless other startups that grow too fast and burn through their investors' money and die. Don't know, possibly, possibly. This is why I like the New York Times is link baiting here. Possibly unnecessarily. I don't know. I, I find this article kind of just mm. silly because... People, it's but one option and you're opting into it and it's like if you pick the foie gras and the steak on the menu you pick that if you pick the you know beyond meat whatever people have choices right what do you think about the fact that you're in an industry that is considered to be grow at what some people think is unsustainable or violent what what's the fair assessment of this criticism slash link baiting article in the new york times i think the truth is in the middle Okay, you, know, you can't us. you can't lump all venture capital and all venture capitalists into the same bucket. Yep. Look, as an entrepreneur in my career, I think I did, you know, six or seven startups total. That wouldn't have been possible without venture capital. Right. So to me, I'm a huge fan of the asset class. Yeah. And now from both sides as of the an table. investor, yeah. you know, I'm helping to create jobs and more importantly these these world positive solutions to big systemic challenges. So I think that's really important, and I, I don't think we can just, with one broad stroke, yeah. say that venture is bad. I think that would not, you, you need to be more intellectually curious than that and unpack it. I do think that venture capital has a responsibility to kind of mate with our own species. We need to actually do the work and make sure when we invest in a company that, number one, we have an underwriting thesis as to how we're going to drive venture capital returns. Hmm. There's a lot of math in venture capital. Yeah, you, what is you, the return expectation? When you put some money into good eggs, what do you expect to get out? You know, for an er, we, we do early end growth, okay. but mostly, so mostly early. And a simple rubric for us is any one early stage investment should have the potential to return the entire fund. Okay, so if you put $5 okay. million into something like good eggs, you, you typically write a what, a three, four, $5 million check? One to five to start, but right. figure 10 to 12 over the life of the company. Okay, so you put $10 million in from a hundred... $191, million fund right now. You need to get uh, 20X. Anyone has to have the ability to go 20X, which means their revenue has to grow 20X. And when I say more. ability, it, there has to at least be that X factor for that. Right, that possibility. That possibility. Right, which means if you have a pizzeria, 
or some mom and, and pop and business, you automatically are excluded from that possibility. That's right. And I have a responsibility to be really clear for my LPs and also to the entrepreneurs I'm meeting with, whether I think there's a fit for venture capital and what they're doing. The toughest part of my job, you do, you do this a lot as well, which is saying no. Right. And I see so many amazing world positive things, but a lot of them are not big enough addressable markets to fit venture capital. Yeah. And that's this okay. In the industry, venture scale, I venture guess. Venture scale, sure. How do, you, how do you tell a founder who thinks they're venture scale that you think they're not? With, how, how do you have that conversation? I mean, with transparency yeah. and with humility and say, yeah. look, if you... Clearly, you think otherwise, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm going to root for you from the sidelines, and maybe you'll prove me wrong. Yeah. And you have the option to come back if we didn't insult you too much, and right. maybe we can make up for it in a Series B. You ever have that happen where you said no in a seed Series A, and you come back in the Series B, Series C? 100%. Yeah, and, tell and, me. And it's great when that happens when you see a company that did everything they said they were going to do. Right. And so if you get another bite at the apple, that can be great. And do they hold it against you that you didn't do the previous round? Is there like a little animosity there or they're just like happy to have you? And Well, if they're back talking to us, they didn't hold it against us. Right. I'm sure there's some that we missed because yeah. they didn't come back. I'm sure right. that's possible. You know, the other thing we do, Jason, that I think is critical, and I don't think all VCs do this, my partner Vishal really kind of invented this at Obvious, which is before we make an investment, we try to do a whiteboard session with the founders to really deeply understand their long-term strategy and roadmap. Hmm. How do you want to grow the business? How, you go, how do you want to go to market? How, how many do you years build is a long-term strategy in your world? Five years? Yeah, okay. But the point being, and in, in the timeline is, is, is less important than the alignment. Hmm. We want to make sure that we believe in their vision. Right. Because they're the operators. They're the ones that are going to have to execute on that vision. Right. And as an entrepreneur, I saw some VCs that want to invest because they want to change the company to match their vision. Right. And I don't think that's a recipe for success. Yeah, that's where it gets a little toxic, where the mm -hmm. founder's like, yeah, I think we can double revenue, and then we can go to two cities, and the right. VC is like, how about 20 cities? Yeah. Can you give me that model? Yeah. What, what's the worst behavior you saw in your 20, 30 years doing this? What's the worst thing you've seen from an investor? Without saying the names of them, obviously, I don't want you to start a war here, but you've seen some bad behavior. That one. The one that you just looked up at yeah. the I mean, ceiling. I mean, it came to mind, one. right? I'm not going to name names, yeah, but, but the worst behavior I've seen is an investor trying to force a startup management team to merge with another <gasps> startup in the portfolio. Oh, God. To try to rescue some other investment. So they want one founder to catch another knife as it's falling to the ground instead of just letting... When you drop yeah, a knife or, in the and kitchen, maybe it's not you so step back. Maybe it's not as dramatic. Maybe, maybe it's an apple and an orange and they mm. want to duct tape them together. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I've you know seen what I'm that talking too. About? Yeah. I, and they would, the VC's motivation there is to mask the loss in company A by folding it into company B. Wouldn't the LPs, the limited partners, the investors in the VC fund understand that implicitly? Wouldn't they see it? it sounds like it's such a dumb strategy for a VC to do it. I, I can't comment because it yeah. wasn't my strategy. I know. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. just knowing what know. you know now with LP yeah. is like, you send your LP a report and it's like, yeah, Acme company got bought by Delta company. It's like, aren't you on the boards of both those companies? And like, what's the thesis here? Yeah. It's like, you're getting a save. I think there's something really important for investors and founders to always remember, which is to stay focused on the customer, Right. listen to the customer, delight the customer. Right. And I think sometimes with investors, they're more focused on buzzwords and momentum and mm. industry shifts and thinking, hey, if we just you know, add this, expand this other thing or acquire this company or invest mm. in this new thing, it'll give us this new technology that's really hot right now. Right. But maybe that's not what our customer needs. Right. And maybe it's like that's a poor use of- slapping crypto on it. Right. What do you think of this? I mean, you were around like I was for the dot-com bubble and burst. You saw the financial crisis had nothing to do with us. And you saw this crypto boom and bust. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on crypto as a technology? What are your thoughts on crypto as uh, a boom and bust cycle? Well, I think as a technology, blockchain and then cryptocurrencies on top of blockchain mm -hmm. are layers of the new Web 3.0, Web yeah. 4.0, whatever number you want to assign to it. We think those are going to be breakthrough building blocks to create new kinds of distributed apps, new kinds of solutions that we haven't seen before. And we're actually 
actively hunting for world positive applications of that. Gotcha. Okay, so we're we're heat seeking for it, but we've gone very judiciously and very slowly. So we did not play any of the momentum games in terms of jumping in onto the ICO. You stepped back and just said, let's see what happens mm-hmm. here. Why did you make that choice to not, because I had made the same choice. Why did you make that choice? Was there something you saw that said, hmm, I don't want to, ju- I don't want to go to this party? Because we both sat the party out. We both got the invite. I, I would add the word. we both didn't go. I would add the word yet to that sentence. I don't okay. want to go to this party yet. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so again, I think we have great, I have great optimism and intrigue for how we apply these new technologies. We've grown up in an industry that's all about new yeah. technologies, right? But yet we didn't want to go to this early party. We didn't go to day one of this party. Right. There was something off. What so, was it? Two things for me. One is that um, I wasn't, in the early days, seeing any, any breakthrough customer solutions. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Just white papers. What on your daily tasks, you know, can you do with this new technology? Yeah. What is the application? Right. Besides money store, transfer, right. and speculation. Right. Those were abundant. Right. right. And I have a couple of investments. You know, Abra is doing money transfer. And I know, I know too much about money transfer from my Zoom days. So I know about the layers of regulation and yeah. the three-letter agencies and the governments. And so, you know, I think there's there's some irrational exuberance in how you use these technologies there. Yeah. Again. Because the governments are not super interested in giving up their control over monetary. Uh, and some they're of not that, super interested in can, giving up monetary control, period. And some of that is national security control. It's beyond sure. monetary. Crime, terrorism. Money and then also, Yeah, yes. money laundering. And yeah. we, there could be an economic terrorism that could occur, you know, if everything is... Mm-hmm. I mean, a 49% Correct. attack where you take over 49% or 51%. 51%, 51% which attack just rather, happened to Ethereum. Which had Ethereum. Like a 51% yeah. attack on the United States dollar would not be a good thing. Right. Conversely, building mm-hmm. a new distributed application that had that is trustless, uh. that incentivizes consumers for the value that they put into the service or the network, that could be incredibly world positive. Yeah. No, it seems to me developers being able to have like a stake in an open source project that manifests itself yeah. over time through the it, cryptocurrency it, is a pretty cool instead idea. Instead of you paying 23 and me. Yeah. Shouldn't they pay you yeah. for your genetic information Absolutely. if you can opt in to different research projects? For sure they should. Maybe they should give you some coins yeah. that appreciate as yeah. those research projects occur. You know, things like that. Yeah. That's, that's what we're, I think, in the early days and mm. of and optimistic that we'll see. What did you think of people raising money mm-hmm. on a global scale? Yeah anonymously mm-hmm. via wallets mm-hmm. without doing any security filings or anything. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The SEC is like, I think there's 70 cases that have been yeah. already started. Yeah. Yeah. Is what I read in the Wall yeah. Street Journal. Yeah. That's 70 out of 1900 ICOs that I think people have tracked. Yeah. That seems like a long way to go. Right. They got all, On the one 3% hand, in. directionally correct. Can we democratize investing? Yes. That's directionally correct. I th- That's the thing that was the conundrum for me, Jason. Yes. I'm looking at that going, I have a syndicate of 2,800. Jason's right. syndicate of 2,800 angel investors. I am the largest syndicate. I've done the largest number of these. I understand many hands makes for light work. There's an appetite to participate in private companies. This is all, would you say, world positive? World positive. This is super world positive. Yes. I want 10,000 people to participate in the next syndicate I do for good eggs or whatever it is. But how do you do that across a hundred different regions that have different definitions of accredited investor and different regulations and reporting? You can't, but it showed that people would put a billion dollars into, uh, what was it? EOS was the one that raised a billion or 2 billion over some period of time. Staggering amount of money. I'm just like, Okay, well, that's basically, what, 10 of your funds? And how much work right. is it for you to go raise a fund? I mean, six right. months of work? Maybe more. More? A year of work? And a lifetime of building a reputation. Mm-hmm. And then these dipshit, CryptoDipshits.com, go raise $2 billion. <laughs> CryptoDipshits.com goes raise $2 billion. And nobody knows who they are. And they wrote a white paper One with One of your listeners in just it. registered that domain name. Yeah, no, too late. I yeah, got CryptoDipshits.com. Okay, yeah, we smart. have a CryptoDipshit t-shirt coming. You're always one coming. step ahead. Yeah. We have a crypt- I'm not saying a domain name here unless I have an interest in it. 
I was looking at it just going, you know, God, I want to participate so badly, but I just don't want to participate in a fraud. The other missing piece uh, for us at Obvious was around governance. Yeah. Is anybody I mean, in charge? Is anybody in charge? I've been in this game long enough to know that it doesn't always go perfectly. <laughs> and you want a set of people and brains around the table that can help when you encounter a board problems. of directors. Like a board. Like a board. And these shares, people were buying tokens. You're not a shareholder. You're not a shareholder. You I'm saying this over and over again for two or no three years. No legal rights. Zero rights. They could literally take, they could sell a million tokens and, and issue a billion more and dilute everybody. And, and forgetting about legal rights, do, you know, don't you want to back entrepreneurs that are actually open to, you know, input and help? Yeah. Especially I mean, the, if the, all they've written some, is a white paper so some, far. There's one school of thought that you don't want that. You just want the, you know, the monster entrepreneur that's done it 20 times and you get out of give, way. give her a check and let her go. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's one school of thought. But for seed stage, early stage, the kind of work that we do, I yeah. think governance and advice is really helpful. Yeah. And I have a responsibility for the capital I manage to yeah, you manage might have, it. <laughs> you might have people who have given you money who are pension funds or endowments from schools or family offices that do good in the world. Exactly. You want to give them their money back. The thing that I thought was interesting is you brought up distributed applications. And this to me, I find very interesting. The The, the concept of a distributed Twitter or a distributed, because mm -hmm. there is one uh, that's been going around. I forgot the name of it. It's like some some name of an animal or something like mm. dinosaur or something. Anyway, there's a distributed Twitter. Jimmy Ward, we producer Jackie. We'll put it in the chat room in a second. But there's mm -hmm. a distributed crypto peer-to-peer -peer Twitter that exists. None of this stuff is broken out, obviously. But I was thinking about like the distributed YouTube. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this idea? There's a distributed YouTube. It's on a blockchain. Nobody controls it. Mm -hmm. You invest in this and anybody can put up any video. Nobody can take a video down. Mm -hmm. Is this a world you want to live in? Is this an investment you want to make? Not an investment I want to make. Because? I, I mean, just, I don't think it fits our world positive themes exactly. that we're focused on. People so, have not thought this out. Easy a, answer for me. Yeah, a YouTube that's, everybody's like, oh, I'm going to invest in this YouTube that's distributed. I'm like, okay, when child porn or revenge porn or a or, beheading or is, algorithmic children's shows that you don't want your kids, kids watching because they yeah when all that stuff gets put on this distributed YouTube that you invested in your name is on all of these misapplications right. that are now forever on the immutable YouTube blockchain centralization is not always bad exactly and decentralization is not always good yeah we have to find the intersection of where these technologies can actually do something good for the end consumer I was trying to figure, I think it's well said, and I think like somebody was explaining to me, like they were talk, we were talking about blockchain last night at dinner, we had our staff dinner, and I was like, you know, the immutable blockchain and this technology is the one of the least efficient database models ever created, mm -hmm. and nobody being in charge and it going away or getting 51% attacked or any of these things, in the case of voting, you probably want to have somebody centrally in control of that, and then your bank account and I, I was trying to think of cases where it not being centrally controlled would be better yeah. and I, I was at a loss yeah I was at a loss I can't find the application I mean I think the application where everybody can see the blockchain I could see that work but I haven't found one where I thought like I, I really want this to not be controlled by anybody well a lot of smart people are working on it so I'm confident we're going to see them we just haven't don't know what's going to happen when we they're don't out know there. yet well, I mean, if you look at the Tor network as an example, this is the mm -hmm. example. Yeah. And what is the primary use case? It's bad behavior. It's generally not being used by people Unless in an authoritative regime. you're a dissident in yes. uh, a, you know, an authoritarian country with yeah. censorship and you're trying to get around their firewall. And that might be like one and out of a thousand people or something. That's the problem I'm seeing. It's, like, it's a very interesting intellectual debate. And technologies are just tools, yeah. right? So they're not inherently good or evil. Yeah. It's what we entrepreneurs and investors do with those technologies. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, I'm fascinated by it. I, I, like I'm racking my brain. The one application I heard that I thought was very clever, because I love this concept of a smart contract, mm -hmm. where we can participate in a contract that mm -hmm. a lawyer doesn't have to do, but mm -hmm. that is you know, on the blockchain I somehow yeah. codified. And I was thinking, 
in art or collectibles. Imagine some emerging artist said, these are my first 10 paintings. I'll sell them to you, James and Jason, for, you know, 500 bucks each. All I ask is that if it gets resold mm -hmm. during my lifetime, mm -hmm. for, you know, for the next 100 years, every time it gets sold, I right. just get 10% back or whatever right. it is. So if I become Picasso and that becomes a $100 million painting, when you sell it for $100 million, my kids get 10% of that. This would be such a wonderful, beautiful, interesting application. Think about music. I mean, think uh, how many lawyers there are in Los yes. Angeles that just manage these rights. Pools of rights. Rules Performance, mechanical, lyrics, all this stuff. Yeah. Right? And now we have streaming music services. We have all the digital plumbing where that could happen really quickly. That would be fascinating. Imagine if... Uh, Phil Kaplan's I was Distro about Kid. To Phil, yeah. yeah. Distro Kid was the first service that let a recording artist set the rules for how their streaming revenues could get split up amongst all the musicians. Right. So the bass player gets something, and for yeah. me, I'm a drummer. So you know, usually the drummer, the drummer never, gets, never gets paid. Yeah. No, they're like, yeah, just put you in the back. You're a drummer. Exactly. I'm always interested by people who are drawn to drumming. Mm. Were you a middle child by chance? Uh, the youngest mm. of two. Oh, okay, because I always thought the drummer was like somebody who needed to vent. Really? Yeah. Well, you're banging and you're in the back, just like in your own world, just banging on You've the drums. You've got the wrong framing, Jason. Oh, yeah? we're not, it's, not, it's not that we're banging. We're, we're the backbone. We're the metronome. We're ah, the clock. We're just God. keeping so everything steady. together, got the it. glue. Mm. That's what we're doing. Fascinating. Um, if somebody wants to raise money from you, yes. have you ever invested in a company that emailed you cold, that you got over the transom? Or are they always ones that came in through a, a trusted referral or friend of a friend or you knew an investor? Anything ever come in directly through email? I'm going to describe three categories of deals that we've done. Okay. The first category is, the, is the, 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 the most obvious, which is the warm referral through mm. you know, a, our network or through one of our entrepreneurs or the, the kind of usual way you get to a VC. That's door number one. Mm. Door number two is that because we do thematic investing, we yeah. actually we do these things we call investment sprints on the team where we take a, a, an area of interest uh, like building construction and we map out the whole market oh. and we talk to experts and we talk to customers and we, you know, we look through your syndicate on angel list mm -hmm. and see what, what's yeah. happening at the seed stage yeah. and, and, and get smart on that. Yeah. And once we do, we sometimes identify an interesting company that we want to talk and to. And you invite them in. And we go chase them. Oh, you got to go check out Blockable then. Blockable. Okay. Yeah. Go check Done. out Blockable.com. Okay. Amazon execs who are building... Mitch Kapoor and Freddie Kapoor and I are on the board. Uh, I used to work for Mitch. You did? Yeah, he's one of my mentors for really? sure. Where? Yeah. Well, uh, at Kapoor Capital and before that, oh, a know. company called X Marks that was originally Fox yeah. Marks. I remember that, that. Mitch started. Ah, uh, yeah, the bookmarking. Bookmark synchronization. I yeah. remember that. Wow, yeah. that was such a great category. I wish Delicious hadn't sold. Right. I remember when you were at Fox Marks. Yeah. Right. So great. Okay, but back to okay, your question. Number three. So, so do, well, door, do, you know, that's three. door number two. Yeah. You know, the first one I call farming. The you know, door number two is hunting, where we're right, going to go sure. out and chase. And there's been you know an interesting door number three. It was one of the early investments uh, that we made. It obvious when we started the firm. One of our we have these three pillars: sustainable systems, healthy living, and people power. Mm -hmm. That are the theme, the kind of meta themes we care about within sustainable systems. You know, Ev and I both you know just have this huge passion for how do we find for-profit solutions to climate change. Mm. And I was an angel investor in a company called Opower that created a breakthrough method of getting consumers to use less energy in their homes ah. through competition with their neighbors. Oh, yes. And Opower had a successful IPO, and then post-IPO, they got acquired by Oracle. Wow. And you know, once you get acquired by Oracle- Who knows what's going to happen? probably the innovation is going to slow. So, a little bit, yeah. so I asked the question, are we really done with energy efficiency or is there something more yeah. after O-Power? And so we went looking and I met with a woman named Susan Norris who runs the energy efficiency team at, at PG&E, mm. our California utility, and told her what we were doing with, with the founding of Obvious and that we were interested in this category. And I said, if you ever see a company that your team mm. is excited about or piloting in the energy oh. efficiency space, please introduce them to me. Yeah. And it literally was like six weeks later, I got an email and she introduced me to an LA entrepreneur named Matthias Kerwig, who had founded a company called NRV. 
And Susan had glowing things to say about this energy efficiency marketplace that they had built and that the pilot went so well that PG&E was moving to a multi-year contract. Huh. That's a great signal as yeah, an investor. And so we jumped on the next plane to LA and we'd never met this entrepreneur before. And yeah. we ended up leading the seed round of that company. Amazing. I like that. All right, listen, we could talk for hours and we do when we're out socially. Totally. Uh, and But here we'll just talk for an hour because I don't want to burn out the gas, but you got to come back uh, and come back soon. Congratulations and uh, continued success with Obvious Ventures. You can go to obvious.com. You can follow Obvious VC on the Twitter as well. And if you want to peruse their incredible portfolio, go to obvious.com slash portfolio. You'll see, uh, I don't know, what, 50, 60? Over 50 now. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. a lot of mouths to feed. That's a, a lot, lot of world positive companies. A lot of world positive companies. Well, they, uh, yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Um, you know, when you when you have the capital to deploy, you know, it's, and I, I see this with the Jewel Company, which was originally the PAX Company, the, you know, the Jewel cigarettes that are destroying World children. Negative. World Negative. But they're in their minds, they thought they were world positive. Well, they originally started just as cannabis or whatever you think it's cannabis, world positive or not. But they thought they were, or at least this is the front they were putting out was, we're going to get people off cigarettes. And I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Yeah. And then the people- I, I didn't people buy it when I first saw, saw that as an investment opportunity and I don't buy it now. I don't. And they didn't they just take money from a big uh, tobacco company, I think? Anyway, those people need to get their heads examined. On Can you ramp imagine? for, you know, teen and tween age nicotine addiction. We ha sm There's a chart. It has smoking going down like this in yeah. teens. And then all of a sudden you see vaping. Boop, yeah. And it's like, well, what's the point yeah. of being rich and powerful yeah. and having money? Yeah. If the way you operate in the world brings back... Yeah. How would we feel if, if a pharma company made chewable mango or mint flavored Vicodin? How would we feel about that? Yeah. Not so good. <laughs> hey, would you like these pina colada uh, oxys? <laughs> like, what? Mm. So here we have these, you know, kid flavored, very high dosage nicotine vape pens that look like USB thumb what drives. a bunch of a-holes. Honestly, to the people at Jewel, kill yourself. Honestly, I just... If you work there and they just paid off all their employees with like a million dollar big, bonus. Big dividend. It's I heard, so yeah. disgusting. And like people who are friends of mine who own, own the stock, just sell the stock in the second market and get yourself out of that. It's so Look, disgusting. I, I'll make a, a less negative comment, but I, you know, for any entrepreneur thinking about doing something like that, if you have so much intellect and creativity and yeah. talent, clearly redirect it. Go yeah. after something world positive. Go solve a big problem. Yeah. Go reimagine transportation and create, you know, electric, planes and electric cars and electric buses there's some i mean and there's a bunch of stuff in the middle that maybe isn't world positive but it's not going to bring back cancer and right. you know t train on we literally spent decades trying to unwind what the <sighs> cancer stick companies did where they would have ads with doctors in them saying two out of three doctors prefer camel it's like really you're using doctors unbelievable to, yeah. to sell cancer sticks yeah. and these scumbags at jewel these horrible, disgusting human beings who work there, these horrible, disgusting investors who are profiting from it. I, you are so dishonest saying that this is not for kids and that you're doing this for that reason because they had ads with a bunch of millennials in them. The ads they have, just type in Jewel ads. And they're getting regulated on this stuff now. Yeah. I mean, and if you, a, if you have to be regulated enough. by the government, this is the lowest form. And you and I are not fans of government regulation. No! When the government has to regulate you, it's, that means you're a horrible human being, and the last person that could regulate you has shown up. Regulate yourselves. God, I'm so pissed here, off here. now. Anyway, well, if you want to get, if you want to get all upset, if, if you want to get happy, go look at you know obvious.com/slash/portfolio. I love good eggs. And uh, see some oh, of you're in Magic companies. Leap and Gusto too. Yes, we Gusto are. Gusto or Gusto? Gusto. 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 We love Gusto, and we love Magic Leap. I don't have a Magic Leap. That's the real deal, right? We should get you one. It's the real deal, correct? It's the real deal. We when were talking we're, about light fields on our yeah, eyes. I mean, yeah. that company reverse engineered how to generate light fields and project them onto your retina. See, I think that's going to be a positive company. Like, it's going to put things into the world think that about it, helpful. Transforming education. Of course. You can now fly a plane. You can or, fold a protein. And you can learn anything in three dimensions yeah. wherever you are on the planet. It's going amazing. to be amazing. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that one. That one's gotten a little bit of negative attention because they raised so much money. Is that fair or unfair? I think that's fair. I think they're, you know, like any company that goes through a, a hype cycle. Do you know the Gartner hype curve? Sure, of talk course, about yeah. you know the they're 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 in the trough of disillusionment right now. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Look, 
Technologies need to get to version three. Yeah. Right? We saw that with, you know, with Windows. We saw that with a lot of products. With everything. Apple Watch, And so Watch, the upside of raising a lot of money is that, you know, you, you have the war chest to get to version three. Exactly. All right. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thanks for having me. Okay, Emmy Watering producer Jackie. Good job setting it up. And we'll uh, director Charles. Well done. Director. We'll the see you all behind next the time curtain. on this week in Stars. Bye-bye.